Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's program. The latest in lung cancer is a clinical trial right for me. So first, uh, my name is Stephanie Trong. I'm founder of The Patient Story, and I'm a cancer survivor myself. Uh, we just had some thoughts of, you know, collaborating with an amazing group, KRAS Kickers, because they're doing such great work in the community. And the topic of clinical trials, I think all of us can agree, can be pretty daunting. Some of you tonight joining us may know a lot. Some may not even know what a clinical trial is. So we're going to try our very best to cover as much ground as possible in the about 60 minutes or so that we have with our incredible panelists tonight. So I get the job of doing a little bit of housekeeping. So just wait a moment. I promise we'll get to the incredible panel very soon. But first, uh, we wanted to make sure that you knew more about um, KRAS Kicker. So for those of you joining us, it's a grassroots nonprofit led by patient advocate leader, uh, Terry Connoran, who's leading our discussion tonight, devoted to KRAS, knowledge plus research plus advocacy equals survivorship. And the focus is for any KRAS oncogene or cancer type with the mission of connecting people to the latest in research, resources, and community. So again, really incredible organization. Um, we're co-hosting it um, here at The Patient Story. I founded the patient and care partner organization after my own cancer experience, going through hundreds of hours of chemo, feeling really alone. And so our mission is to humanize cancer so you know that you are not alone. And we also invest in educational programs like tonight's to help empower you and or your loved one in your own care. We cover cancers across the board, including lung cancer, with a focus on biomarkers and clinical trials. And we wanna thank, uh, give special thanks to Amgen, Marathi, Genentech, and AstraZeneca for supporting our educational program. But we also wanna stress that the patient story and KRAS kickers retain full editorial control of this entire program. Speaking of which, this program really is not meant to be medical uh, advice substitution. We want you to walk away knowing more and asking questions of your own medical team, but please consult with your own medical team before making decisions. And lastly, on this whole housekeeping uh, speech here, is we, we really do want to hear from you. Uh, we want to know, was this program helpful? And what topics you'd like for us to focus on in the future? So please fill out our survey. It will pop up once this program closes, and that will automatically enter you into a raffle for a couple of our uh, $50 Amazon gift cards. Okay, so with that all being said and behind us, I'm really excited to introduce everyone tonight. Um, many of you may have already seen her face or heard her talk before. Um, our patient advocate moderator today, uh, Terry Connoran, I'm very lucky to call her a friend now, um, who shared her story on our platform at the patient store a few years ago. And so Terry, I know, and a lot of us know how passionate you are as an advocate. You're out there, you're trying to make sure people know um, how to be empowered in their care. And so I'm going to go off camera so that you can lead tonight's discussion with our amazing uh, doctors tonight. But first, can you share a little bit more about your personal story and what led you here? Sure. You know, I, it, it's such a, it's such a blessing to be able to be anywhere after you get diagnosed with lung cancer. Six and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer and went through treatment that was chemo and surgery. And I had no evidence of disease and started getting connected with other lung cancer groups and started hearing about biomarkers and such and started pushing my doctor, not getting the information I, I, I needed or I wanted. Um, I pushed, pushed, pushed. And eventually after about two years, ended up at a second opinion. The second opinion doctors, the one that told me I had a KRAS. And I swore if I knew what it was, I wanted to connect with other people so that we can all learn what this means and how we can make it better to live with KRAS cancers. And we need to take KRAS and turn it into an acronym for knowledge plus research plus advocacy equals survivorship. So we're all here together to kick cancers KRAS. So I'm delighted to be here tonight. This is all about the hope that we've learned over the past couple of years. And I'm going to just be tickled to death to actually in, in, um, introduce you to our two speakers this evening. Um, first up, we have, um, let's see, Dr. Okay. I've never actually said your name out loud. Okay. Uh, Estela Mari Rodriguez, right? Estela. And she is a, Estela. Uh, Estela. Okay. Because that's what I, I know you as. Estela. Okay. Um, is a hematologist, oncologist at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. University of Miami Health System, 
and she specializes in early detection and treatment of lung cancer. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for the invitation. Delighted to be here. Okay, we also have with us um, Dr. Jason Porter, no hiccups over your name, doctor, um, and you're a hematologist oncologist at the West Cancer Center Research Institute in Memphis, Tennessee. He's the director of the Lung Cancer Disease Research Group and specializes in treating patients with molecularly altered lung cancers and lung cancers with no actionable driver mutations. Thank you, Dr. Porter, for being here with us again tonight. Absolutely. I'm super excited. Um, Stella, it's so good to see you again yes. um, and looking forward to tonight's discussion. Okay, we've got a lot of ground to cover, and we certainly could be spending hours discussing all the things that is that we have to say. So let's just kind of like just dive right in. Okay, good doctor. Uh, let's see, Dr. Porter, if you just kind of like go over super high level, what are the different types of lung cancer that there are? Okay, so, you know, when somebody is new in my clinic and I'm telling them about lung cancer, I basically divide it because they want to know, do I have the really bad one or the one that's not so bad? Most people have heard that small cell lung cancer is more aggressive. And so that's um, kind of what's in the back of people's minds. So do I have that one or a non-small cell lung cancer? And basically what it means is when we look under the microscope, how does it look? Is it big or is it small? The, the cells, the individual cancer cells. And so non-small cell is the same thing as saying large cell or um, cells that aren't as small under the microscope. And we look and we divide that into basically three large categories. There's a non-squamous there's a squamous, and then there's large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And then out, outside of those three, there's some other rare histologies that we don't see quite as often, but those are the more common ones. And then the small cells, um, we call small cell when we look under the microscope, and they're little bitty blue, you know, round cells. So when we look at adenocarcinoma, this is the most common type of lung cancer and the most, the most common non-small cell lung cancer. And then it's squamous cell carcinoma. And then the large cell neuroendocrine is a different type of tumor. When we look on the per, on the patient's body, um, the airways, hopefully you can see my chest here if you're looking, um, the airway is here, the trachea, and then it breaks off to left and right lung. Squamous cells line the, the epithelium. That's the type of tissue that we see in the upper airway. So this is where we're more likely to see squamous cell carcinoma. And then the adenocarcinomas happen more peripherally in the lung fields. So that's the difference in where we actually see those tumors. And then small cells um, can pretty much happen anywhere. Um, so those are pretty much the basic types of lung cancer and how I describe them for my patients. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely does. Okay, then Dr. Rodriguez, if you could kind of go over what the different sorts of like biomarkers there are, like that was real high level. Now let's kind of drill down a little bit into the genomics of this. Yeah, that's a great question because, you know, when I started my training, and I'm not that old, um, we really only knew about lung cancer that was, like you mentioned, those are Porter, that was like the non-small cell, the small cell, and how we looked on the microscope. But now we really need to dig deeper into the genes that cause the cancer because we have today 10 biomarker-driven treatments for specific types of cancer. So we know um, that a lot of these genes, mutations, on oncogenic drivers, genes that cause cancer, were first described in adenocarcinoma, but they can be seen in any, there's mutations in any type of cancer. And I think if you have a diagnosis of advanced lung cancer and now even earlier stages of lung cancer, it is important that not only do you get a biopsy so that you understand what the histology, how it looks on the microscope, but that you get that test about the genes that cause the cancer. And so the biomarkers are those, those genes that we have discovered are driving cancer and that at least 10 of those we have been successful at, as identifying, although a lot of them have been seen in adenocarcinoma and initially they were first describing never smokers. We see them on people who have smoked a long time, who have smoked who stopped smoking a lot of, a long time ago. So it really has nothing to do with smoking history. It has nothing to do with gender. It just has to do with the cancer. So, and it's any part of the information that is critical to get at the beginning of the treatment so that you can pick the best treatment for the patient. So we, a, pa a patient that gets started without that information may not be started on the right treatment. Um, so that's why it's important to do that test. It is usually ordered in the tumor specimen, or it could also be ordered what they call liquid biopsy through your blood, a blood test. 
Okay, and the, well, that's a good um, starting point. Is there a difference of what comes back liquid compared to like a biopsy in your of your lung? So the gold standard, what we we think uh, we most likely are to find the source of the genes is going to be the tumor. But many times when you do a biopsy, you get part of the tumor that is very necrotic, like dead tissue, and the actual DNA inside that tumor, it's not good enough to get all the information that you need, and you actually learn more from the blood. Now, the other thing can happen. You can have a blood test that's completely negative in terms of actionable mutations, but there's a lot in the tumor specimen. So a lot of centers, and mine included, we try to do, if we can, both tests at the same time because they both can be complementary and they are specific some mutations, especially like RNA fusions that we're learning about, not gene mutations, but sometimes two genes coming together. And those new proteins, sometimes you can identify it through the blood. And the blood test, we have a lot of blood, so we can get that in the office and get results in seven to 10 days. So it's been, it's been really a technology that has allowed us to treat patients faster with the right treatment that we didn't have available like 10 years ago. Right. Okay. Now, what are the most common types of biomarkers in the lung cancer, Dr. Porter? So, um, you know, a long time ago, we found EGFR um, as a biomarker. And then we have also the KRAS mutations, which is obviously very important and a, a part of um, the reason for our discussion tonight. But we found KRAS actually a long time ago and for such a long time couldn't target it. Um, it can serve as number one a biomarker that we can use to target for treatment, um, and then also a prognostic biomarker that kind of give us some information about how a tumor may behave. So we have both prognostic and diagnostic biomarkers outside of KRAS as well. So we also have PD-1 and PDL one which is a protein that we can study to kind of give us an idea about how our immune checkpoint therapies may work um, when we treat non-small cell lung cancer. And then we also have BRAF, and we have um, ALK and ROS1, and all of these different proteins that may be, as um, Dr. Rodriguez already alluded to, driving the cancer or just giving us information on how that different cancers may respond to treatment. What's really interesting is that we used to associate these biomarkers that were drivers with non-smoking. And now we have drivers that are actually associated with smoking and so testing biomarkers is becoming very important for all patients, regardless of their smoking history. And so BRAF is one of those biomarkers that we can see present in smokers, as well as KRAS, which we talked about. And then MET exon 14 is another biomarker that's also an actionable biomarker that we can target in therapy that may be associated with smoking. And so um, we've now discovered that basically we need to do biomarker testing in all our lung cancer um, and, and obviously we know that's very important. Okay. And so Dr. Rodriguez, are all the KRAS and EGFRs the same as it's like either your KRAS, EGFR or not? Um, so, you know, the, the world has become more complex as the technology um, has allowed us to really dig in. It's almost like an alphabet of different mutations that are in each of these genes. Um, so for example, EGFR, the more common mutations are deletion 19 or exon 21 changes. But even when you look at that whole protein, there's a lot of insertions and atypical mutations that before we used to kind of ignore because we didn't uh, identify them very commonly and we didn't think that they mattered, uh, but they do matter. They actually, now we have drugs developed, for example, for EGFR20 insertion, which is something that was there all along unrecognized and those patients were not responding to the traditional treatments for EGFR because they had a different type of configuration of that protein that allowed, they needed a different type of drug to work. The same thing with KRAS, um, you know, there's a lot of KRAS mutations and it can be a whole alphabet of different KRAS mutations. We do know that KRAS G12C, that is a bigger proportion of those KRAS mutations has uh, new, two newly approved um, targeted therapies that we can offer those patients that have that KRAS G12C, but we also see patients that have other types of cancer of the colon and the lung, other parts of the body that do share these KRAS mutations and they may be of a different variety. And because they're all different, we're gonna, the work that's left to do and where we have to invest in research is to really define 
what's going to be the best treatment for each of these parts of the of the mutation that the patient is encountering. Well, we did get one of the questions from um, the audience. This is from Bill. Um, will advances for one biomarker benefit another? So, for example, will G12C drug work for somebody who has G12D? So I would say that right now, um, there may be people using them, but the best way to, to do this is to continue to do clinical trials that are specific for each variant. Um, and there may be um, some cross reactivity, but it may not be optimal. And so it's just like if you walk up to a door and you try a key, it may open it even if it's not designed for that door, but the chance is much lower. And so when we have a KRAS G12D mutation, I've known a people, you know, a few people in clinical practice who actually used the G12C inhibitor and maybe, you know, because there wasn't anything else for the patient and they couldn't get to a clinical trial and we saw response, but that's definitely not the best way. Um, again, like going up to a door that you really need to get into, but you have a key that may or may not work. Um, so it's really very risky um, and shouldn't be done unless, you know, unless you um, don't have any other choices, but really getting onto a clinical trial that's specific for any particular biomarker is the best way. Okay, well, I think that's probably the, the best place to be talking about the clinical trials for each biomarker. Um, I know that we just kind of came out of the big annual World Lung Conference. Um, I, I wasn't there. Um, Dr. Rodriguez, do you want to tell us some of the excitement that happened around KRAS or EGFR and or? I'll cover EGFR, which I'm, I'm a little bit more familiar, but um, I, I think what is happening is that there's, um, we are, we are, two things are happening. We're getting more data of patients that have been treated for a long time in whatever option we had, like for example, osimertinib, which is the first drug that is used for EGFR. And then we're learning that people progressed. And um, what the next question is, how can we pre um, avoid the preve prevention? How can we treat those resistant clones earlier? So some of the exciting data that came out was example, FLORA2, which is a trial that use the same backbone of osimertinib, which is the targeted therapy that we use for most patients and added chemotherapy. And the question was, would patients do better if they have that proper targeted therapy along with chemo, will they be able to decrease the burden of disease and, um, and be managed better to prevent resistant clones in the future? That's one of the, the theories. And I was surprised, happily surprised that it made a big difference. Like we, used, we I always used to think that Osimertinib works very well. You get a lot of responses. And then when people, when it stops working, you can try chemo and then you have that to try. But I didn't expect that those patients will have almost nine months of improvement in, 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 in disease in terms of like they were relapsing. They were less likely to relapse if they were getting chemotherapy up front. And then with that same concept of making the treatment up front more aggressive, there were other antibody drug conjugates that were presented, and we're going to see a lot of exciting data with these new drugs that bind a receptor and kind of inject chemotherapy into cells. So for the EGFR space, we saw um, a trial that is called the Herthina trial that used patritumab, which is an antibody to HER3, which is another antibody similar to EGFR, kind of in the same space, and it basically would inject chemotherapy to those cells that have become resistant. We saw data for that, and there'll be trials adding that antibody drug conjugate to the first-line therapy. Um, we also saw uh, the Mariposa trial, which is a drug that is approved for EGFR20 insertion, trying to use that drug, which is an antibody-type drug, trying to use that drug up front uh, with an EGFR inhibitor called lacertinib. So there's a lot of excitement about combining drugs, um, not really sitting back and waiting for things to happen, but like trying to be more proactive. Um, but the data that was kind of more mature was this FLORA2 trial in EGFR. Okay, all right. And then how about um, the, uh, in, as far as KRAS is concerned, Dr. Porter, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So KRAS, um, as I talked about earlier, is a very interesting biomarker because we've known about it for such a long time. And um, one of the clinical trials in KRAS is um, CRYSTAL-1 um, clinical trial. So first to say, we have two drugs that are approved right now um, by the FDA in second line use for KRAS G12C. 
Um, and that is sotorasib and adagrasib. And so crystal one clinical trial is one that was a phase one, two um, clinical trial of patients um, with different tumor types that had KRASH G12C um, mutations. And the um, lung, lung, small cell lung cancer cohort was included there. And so we have the data from the crystal one that continues to mature. Um, and we see response rates of around 35% um, in a crystal one um, cohort non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and these, again, were patients with both smoking and non-smoking histories, um, mostly male patients. Um, but as that data continues to mature, um, particularly in non-small cell lung cancer, it's now been FDA approved for use in the second line after patients progress on an immune therapy-based treatment. So an immune therapy plus or minus chemotherapy. And so um, very interesting to see that as um, Dr. Rodriguez um, alluded to with the FLORA 2 trial, where we're adding chemotherapy to these targeted therapies and what's the tolerability going to look like and is it really going to cause benefit? Likely in KRAS G12C targeting and clinical trials, we have further study with Adagrasib, particularly with the trial Crystal 17, which is looking to add chemotherapy to Adagrasib um, plus or minus, um, well, with an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, and so it's just becoming a much more robust combination of therapies in the more advanced setting for the KRAS G12C patients, where we're um, familiar with the fact that the KRAS G12C patients are more likely to be smokers. And so they're probably having other co-mutations that may uh, additionally be driving the tumor outside of KRAS G12C. So this is where it becomes particularly interesting for me to see the addition of chemotherapy to the KRAS G12C inhibitor so that we are covering clones or parts of the cancer that are not actually being driven by the KRAS G12C mutation. And so it will hopefully increase not only the outcomes for those patients, but the response rates will hopefully be higher as we see um, with the EGFR inhibitor plus chemotherapy and then the duration of response and survival for those patients. So starting out with sotorasib and adagrasib now approved in second line, and then adding chemo and immune therapy to those drugs um, in more advanced settings um, upfront to hopefully improve outcomes, durations of response and survival for those patients. Okay. And so what I'm hearing you guys say is essentially, it's not like I only have one biomarker and then this is what I have. And this is, and, and just, that's it. There's a little bit more to it. So whether it's a PDL one, I have a biomarker. Um, there may be a biomarker that comes on down further or not um, as, as a result of like treatments or what have you, but that makes a difference. Am I tracking with you? Absolutely. Um, I think it makes a huge difference. Um, in the case of, you know, EGFR, as Dr. Rodriguez talked about, more likely to be just that one single biomarker that we need to focus on and maximize response and benefit from targeting that pathway. But when it comes to KRAS, we know that there can be so many other drivers along with it. Um, and it's essentially, when I think about it, I think about like, okay, if this patient were a smoker or if they had had environmental exposures, they won't have one single driver. They may have other um, basically carcinogenic um, consequences um, for or from being exposed to cancer causing agents like that we have in smoking or the environment like radon. So more than one gene may be affected as opposed to these single gene driven tumors like EGFR and ALK and ROS1. Okay. Did you want to add anything, Dr. Rodriguez? Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing that has become clear to me is that, you know, patients need to empower themselves with this information. And there have been many cases that I have seen a second opinion or patients that, that I have gotten to know that the information was there. It just wasn't acknowledged. So like they had a test earlier on in their disease and it was kind of ignored um, because it wasn't what the doctor was doing at the time. Like either the patient went to surgery and they had a KRAS G12C mutation and that wasn't recognized or the patient had chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and then that was kind of not acknowledged. And then the patient missed an opportunity to get a treatment earlier on that we know can work. So, you know, that's another part of this that I think it's an understanding that the science moves and there's new options and new combinations, but that you can't make any decisions until you have the information in front of you. Okay. All right. And then we did get a question from, from the audience about um, an article suggesting that the revolution in medicine is doing research for KRAS 
KRSG 13C. In fact, I just saw today they were talking about their KRSG 12D um, trials opening up. Um, but you see nothing further, no further research on any clinical trials for these. Do you have any updated information on this? Because I know G13C is different than G12C. Yeah, so we have one of their trials open. And um, so it's for the G12C agent that is always on. So there's, there's this concept with these drugs that they can bind a receptor and come off and that you could hopefully develop better drugs that will either overcome that problem with the binding. So you can combine it with chip 2 inhibitors is one, one of the trials that they have, or you can develop a better a drug that is constantly on the, the inhibiting this, this part of the pathway. Um, so I, I we, again, I think the trials are still early on. Um, but they, I think I'm looking for, I seen some of the preclinical data. We have one of their KRAS G12 on agents from Revolution Medicine and, and they're just enrolling more patients. So the, the trial is showing some results, but I don't think they have published anything there that I can say, you know, we're ready. Okay. Right. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the G13 um, clinical trials at home, um, but I have been following them. Um, and the same thing as what Dr. Rodriguez said, hopefully um, we will find um, the first one that came to me in my um, next generation sequencing was only about a year ago. And when I saw it, I saw the C and I got really excited and I looked and I was like, 13, oh, come on. Like I was ready to put my patient on, on a clinical trial for G12C. So the 13 really kind of caught me off guard in that particular one, because it was the first one I have seen in my clinical practice. Um, so I'm looking forward to these as well as the G12D and other um, PAN-RAS inhibitors as they continue in development. Because um, once we have more ability to target the variants, this pool of patients will grow so much and it's going to be so exciting that EGFR is really a big piece of the pie whenever you're looking at those. And G third, I mean G12C has now come and it's almost equivalent to EGFR. But once we add the other relevant variants and have therapies that target those other variants, KRAS is going to far exceed all of the other oncogenes um, in non-small cell lung cancer and non-squamous anyway. So that's going to be a really exciting time. It is an exciting time. I'd love to kind of drill down a little bit deeper into some of the clinical trials and you know what you guys are hearing, what you're seeing, um, like, hey, like what's hot? Well, um, for me, um, particularly the KRAS, um, the excitement um, got a little bit kind of curtailed with the toxicity that we see sometimes when we add the G12C inhibitors with immune checkpoint inhibitors. So we may see a little bit more um, immune mediated side effects like hepatitis, pancreatitis, um, type one diabetes development. Some of the things that I've seen in my own clinical trials with the KRAS inhibitors plus um, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so um, the tolerability with the combinations was a little bit um, unnerving initially, but I think we felt the same way about the immune checkpoint inhibitors when we first started using those, even in monotherapy. Imagine the experience with that first pneumonitis, you know, and with the first dermatitis. And I had a patient the other day who had some mucosal issues going on from just immune checkpoint inhibition alone. So when we first encountered these, it was very unsettling, but now we feel so much more comfortable with these um, side effects. And I think even the combination um, so it's really, really exciting to see um, just the combinations of KRAS inhibitors with chemo plus or minus immune therapy. Um, I think that, you know, just for the reasons we already discussed and the um, unlikelihood of right now the KRAS inhibitors being used in monotherapy frontline, to see those and to kind of get to explore the toxicity and figure out how to use them in combination, um, modifying doses and doing all of these things is very exciting because we, I assume, like we see with EGFR, that it's going to improve outcomes when we're able to bring them in combinations. So any combination is very exciting. The, the G13 is exciting to me too. Um, again, I've only seen two in clinical practice and the first one was really a surprise to me. Um, so as we develop these PAN-RAS inhibitors, um, again, more excitement for me. Um, I don't know about you. What about you, Dr. Rodriguez? Yeah, I mean, I think that, the, again, it was also seen in EGFR, but this whole message of treating patients earlier with chemo and the targeted therapy um, really like, you know, really like got my attention because we have seen in, I mean, our practice patients that have this mutation, but we have to wait second line, meaning we have to wait through 
go through chemotherapy and immunotherapy, and some of them get very sick. And it's very sad to me that they never got to see that targeted therapy. So being able to give them a response. So I think in the in the trial that combined carboplatin uh, based chemotherapy with um, alagrasib, they the they saw responses like over of sixty percent. So they were able to bring up the responses that you wouldn't see with chemotherapy with the combination. So I think that patients kind of sometimes get a good chance to decrease the burden of disease, especially we know that some patients with KRAS mutations have a lot of burden of disease, it's very aggressive, um, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of symptoms. So we were able to help them with all our drugs up front, and we can find a way to deal with the toxicity. I think we'll be able to help more patients. Yeah. And earlier, they're more likely to tolerate a, a more robust regimen, you know, so um, it's also exciting to get to do that a little bit earlier. Definitely, we suppress the subclones that are being driven by the, the driver that we're targeting. Um, but then um, when we don't or aren't able to use chemo and or immune therapy up front, those other clones that grow through are resistant to our therapy and, and may even be more resistant to chemotherapy later. So we just see lower response rates. And then um, where we have these drivers in second line, I think, um, like you said, it's really sad to see those patients come to that point and then be clinically not able to tolerate whatever the therapy is. I definitely had a patient with a G12C mutation who wasn't a candidate for clinical trial in frontline. So when we got to second line, his effusion was refractory, um, even um, loculated and not um, amenable to easy drainage. And he was definitely not a candidate for the VATS where we go in and kind of clean that out. So um, trying to get him onto the G12C inhibitor at that point was, you know, really, we it was impossible. He couldn't tolerate it. And even though he um, was on for a very short period of time, he spent most of that time hospitalized um, and eventually went on hospice. But to imagine bringing that to an earlier, um, you know, line of his therapy, where when I first met him, he was walking into the clinic and, and really still robust and being able to target at that time would have really been nice for him. Yeah, I, it seems like we really need to be very strategic mm -hmm. about what the treatments are. And if you don't have all this information going into it up front, you can't be strategic at all. You know, right. uh, you, know you, you guys were mentioning, you know, the EGFR group of patients is equal to the amount of KRES G12C patients, right? And th yet they've had a whole lot more um, studies, a lot more drugs that have been going on. And so we're not there yet. When it comes to some of those other like KRAS subtypes, let alone some of the others as well. But I do keep hearing you both bring up about the smoking. Is it that important where it got here from? Or is that just like, it's just one of those things that keeps like getting reported out? For me, it's not important um, where we got here from. But for me, what we have to remember is stigma. And we want to forget the actual stigma, but remember that stigma is a problem. And so the reason I always bring up smoking is because I was sitting in a room with a very, very smart oncologist who told me, well, this patient was a smoker, so they're less likely to have an oncogene driver. And I was like, well, 20 years ago, you know, or 30 years ago, that would have been true. And so I like to use smokers and next generation sequencing and studies in the same sentence so that people start to make the association that you can definitely have a driver that's actionable, even with a history of smoking. And then again, the point that I made earlier about BRAF, MedExon 14, and even KRAS, you're more likely to find those drivers with FDA approved therapies in smokers. And so um, where it becomes relevant for me for a never smoker is that we know they're less likely to respond to respond to immune therapy by itself. So, um, you know, but for smokers, I like to just keep saying that and putting NGS testing in the same sentence. So people stop having this association that the oncogene driver patient is a young female Asian never smoker, because that's what we learned in medical school, you know. And so to kind of really change that narrative, I don't want it to seem like I'm harping on smokers. I'm just harping on the fact that smokers can have drivers and that we have to study everybody. We have to. Thank you for clarifying that, because that's exactly what I was hoping that you would say. Right. Okay. Right. Is that it's it used to be, oh, they're a smoker, don't need to test. Now it is a smoker. Okay, 
we definitely need to test. And part of the important part is what that means for what's next. And so right. that's why I'm really glad that you answered that for me. Thank right. you. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to jump to the I don't want to miss these little videos that we've got here. And I, I'm trying to I'm trying to stick to a script and I'm not doing very well. But I'm, I'm we have two fantastic videos of patients that went through clinical trials, and then I'm going to feel like, okay, we've got enough space. I can get really down into it a little bit more. So let, let's see the let's see the first one if we could, please. Great, thanks Terry for having me here today. I really appreciate the time. Uh, my name is Mike Smith. I have stage four lung cancer. I was diagnosed in 2016, and uh, much like uh, most people's diagnosis, it came to very much stunning, particularly since I uh, was a non-smoker. In discussion with my oncologist, and also with um, what available uh, treatments were available, I was presented with, hey, we can go with the FDA approved drug that I could go on called Tegriso, or I could go on this alternative treatment, a clinical trial. And I think our thinking here was that if in fact I went on a clinical trial drug that was supposed to work as well or better, that I could perhaps uh, extend my life. It was one of the earlier ones to get in, but there wasn't a lot of people in the clinical trial. There was no drug name with it. It just gives you one of those alpha you know, character names with it. Uh, I was flabbergasted. I said, hey, I made the right decision on this, right? Because the benefit of this is I got a clinical trial that's working. Even if it fails at some point, I've got reduction in tumors. I've got now something that, you know, an extension of life. So my name is Joanne. I was diagnosed in November of 2021 with stage four non-small cell lung cancer, uh, KRAS G12V. Um, I had several standard of care treatments, um, all of which resulted in progression. Um, luckily, I got onto a trial in February of this year. Uh, it was a targeted therapy, um, and it was a daily pill, which was wonderful, no more infusions. Um, I had great quality of life for six months, um, very minimal side effects. I was able to go back to work. I was in a really good place, and uh, unfortunately, my last scan showed progression, but I think the next step is uh, another clinical trial, um, probably immunotherapy. So I, I, I definitely feel like my um, knowledge of the, the clinical trials and sort of my ag aggressiveness in the whole process um, certainly helped me. I would say go for it. Um, I would say ask as many questions as you possibly can um as many questions as you could possibly think of and i i also feel like uh, a second opinion is always a, a good idea it's never a bad idea um and in fact it, it's also even if they don't give you a different direction it's the peace of mind you get from knowing that the direction you're going in now is the right way to go is invaluable Those are some powerful stories and it's not made up stories. These are like the real people that are doing this. It's pretty amazing stuff. It really is. Um, to hear um, Mike's excitement about the clinical trials is, um, and to hear kind of how he thought about what the possibilities were um, as, as it was being presented to him, um, I think is really um, exciting. Um, and, you know, some of the things that our patients do ask us when we bring up the topic of clinical trials to them, you know, and what they can expect, I think um, he really captured um, one aspect or one perspective that I can definitely appreciate. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, 
we don't hear enough from people that have a good experience in a clinical trial. And I think that, you know, we, we have a lot of patients that think that they're going to be experimented on and that they're going to be getting a placebo. And I, you know, I work in an experimental therapeutic clinics where everybody gets a drug. We're not giving placebo drugs for those in phase one trials, phase two trials. They're all about testing a drug. Now, we don't know how good those drugs would work, but um, as we look at the data coming out, and, and one, of, one of the things that has really changed in oncology is that we're getting results faster and drugs faster to patients, sometimes not as fast as you will need them, but much faster than it used to be. And I think biomarker testing has allowed us to do better trials because now we can you know, find the right patients that are more likely to respond to some of these uh, treatment options when in the past we will have a new drug and it will be given to everyone with or without chemo. And then obviously the responses were very low because you were not really looking for those patients that were more likely to benefit. Um, and I would encourage patients, you know, um, to like really to think of second opinions as a good thing, not a bad thing. And I have patients that come to me and they're like, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to go speak to so-and-so. And I'm like, I am delighted that you're going to go speak to someone else. First of all, because they're all, we're all friends and no I one here, if, if you have a doctor that gets upset about this, it's kind of odd, no? Because I think that if I was a pay, if I was going through this, I would want to learn from other people, get a different perspective, and maybe another doctor can see something that was missed. And I think that it is good to do that. And you're not gonna, you know, hurt your doctor's feelings, and they're not gonna stop treating you. Um, and clinical trials the same way. Like the 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 patients that are most likely to go into trials are patients that have been on trials before. So we have a lot of patients that we see that had a good experience and, and that opens a whole new door of options for them. Uh, so I would encourage people to look, you know, uh, fortunately everything's consolidated in clinicaltrials.gov. It's a website where you can put in your mutation and your state and just get a readout of trials that are open. And then just like knock on doors, like all of those trials have an email of an investigator and a nurse coordinator. And I do that for my patients. I say, okay, we're going to write an email here and you're going to find out if this trial is open. And sometimes there's a trial like right next door that you hadn't even known about. And, and it's just, you have to do the work. I, it is I, a lot of work. No, it's a lot of work. And I do appreciate you pointing out the fact that we are friends. And I feel like the lung cancer community of doctors is the coolest group of people ever. I mean, that's just the way I feel. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, obviously I'm biased, but um, just the other day, coming back from World Among in Singapore, I had a patient who's progressing. He said two letters to me, MD, and I was already typing the email to one of my colleagues who is at MD Anderson and say, hey, my patient's progressed and I don't have a trial that's right for him. Would you look at it? And, you know, he's going down to see um, my colleague and it's not about me or my feelings, I love my patient and I want him to be okay. And I want to make sure he gets access to whatever is out there that may benefit him. And um, like Dr. Rodriguez said, if, if we get upset, it's probably something odd about us. Uh, there's really no reason to get upset. I mean, it takes a village. And as a provider in one single location with limited resources, if I open the network and use everything that's out there, I just, you know, exponentially increase the chance that my patient's going to find something that's tolerable and that may be very effective for them. And so um, if your patient and your doctor is not really considering or giving you the option to discuss clinical trials, you may need to consider reaching out on your own, maybe get in touch with Terry or, or reach out to us and see about, you know, what options may be there. Yeah, it, it really is different than I thought it was because I'm, I'm not a doctor. I didn't know anything about this. And the surprise was that you don't do clinical trials as a last ditch effort. And this is just like they randomly throw stuff at you. I had no idea. There's an actual order to it. You qualify for it. And, and, and it matters a lot on what your biomarkers are. Right. Um, definitely, we don't want to take it as a last, last ditch effort because number one, when we get ready to go on clinical trials, we have to control for as many variables as possible. And that means are the kidneys functioning okay? Because if something happens on the trial and the kidneys weren't functioning well, it could be a complication of the kidney dysfunction. And then the drug kind of gets associated with that 
you know, unfortunate outcome. So we have to control for those things. So earlier in a disease like lung cancer, you're less likely to have some of those other disease issues that may exclude you from the clinical trial. So doing it earlier is better. And then when I thought back, because I came into my clinical practice around the time that immune therapy was starting to come into second line FDA approval. And I thought about the people who went on immune checkpoint inhibitor as an early part of those clinical trials before I was even in fellowship and the ones who are still responding now from 2013, 2014, there are still some survivors. And so for those patients who went on early, the clinical trial sometimes gives you the best therapy before it's even available for general use. And so honestly, NCCM, which is one of our guideline kind of compendium, says that the best therapy for a patient with, with lung cancer or with any cancer is in a clinical trial. And if you end up getting that early, you have that long-term benefit. And then like five years later, the FDA is approving that therapy. And guess what? You got it way back when, when it was still, you know, being discovered and understood. And so definitely not a last ditch effort and sometimes access to the most effective thing available. Well, as it kind of relates to that, we did have a question that was asked about new immunotherapy trials coming online. Will previous trial patients likely be able to participate or is that um, going to exclude them? Um, so we have, so that's the beauty of this earlier phase trials that they will take patients that have, and those are the patients that we want to offer treatment, patients that have failed immunotherapy, not failed because the treatment, they didn't fail, the treatment didn't work. And then you want to find a different way to treat them. And they don't, so a lot of the trials that we do uh, after immunotherapy is a new immunotherapy that is in a different way or a vaccine trial or a different mechanism to try to wake up the immune system, because in a way, most tumors can possibly be um, treated with immunotherapy. They become um, what we call them hot tumors that are more likely to activate the immune system. And some tumors lose that capacity. Either you have an innate resistance that is not a tumor that is very hot in that end. And you can do something to it. Like we have tried different things like radiation followed by immunotherapy. Um, there's a lot of exciting um, vaccine trials that are trying to... Um, kind of really push that immune response in a, in a, in a, and while we have seen the success of the memory of the T cells in a longer way, uh, infiltrating T lymphocytes, which are like white cells of your own body that get activated against the tumor and then given back to you to kind of do like a more directed immune therapy. So those are treatments that immunotherapy can possibly help patients with many different biomarkers, but still the biomarker driven research and treatment is very exciting because sometimes you get those very deep and long responses. And one of the other excite, excitement that I saw was really in the ROS1 and NTRAC space. Uh, we had a new drug, Reprotrectinib. They all mm -hmm. end the same way. But these drugs, like when they, when, when we understand how you can bind these receptors and do better, then you can, the next drug can have even a higher response. So some of these drugs have responses of like 70% with like intracranial responses that are over 40%. So that means that we get better at the next generation of the drug. And that's what I hope for the KRAS G12C story, that the next generation of these drugs will be, we already have seen Alagraseb and Sotorasep have intracranial activity that is real. You know, when I will give you a, an example from this week, I had a patient that I was getting ready for a next generation KRAS inhibitor and I thought she was progressing and I did all the studies to get her ready for the trial. And actually she had a complete response. So I could <laughs> put her in the trial. So I was all geared up to like, okay, we're going to neatly quickly get you to this next KRAS inhibitor. And the one she was on was working very well. Like she had a, a response in the brain and the plural disease she had went away. So these are real things. And I think, again, we go back to identifying the biomarkers early so that you could get on the right track. What a great problem to have that she was responding so well, she didn't have to go to it. Right. That's exciting. Yeah. Right. And, but at the same time, you're looking forward to what's next, but that does kind of like circle into how is it we actually find the clinical trials. Okay. Clinical trials.gov is, is really complex. Okay. So can you bring in the scope a little bit more for us? Let me start with you, Dr. Porter. Sure. Um, I think that an amazing resource for finding a clinical trial is your doctor. 
And um, that's the, I think, where you need to start. Um, but obviously you can't wait in case that it's not presented as an option for you. So if you have access or if a patient has access to their biomarker analysis or they know they have any particular mutation, you may just go and search that mutation clinical trials on the internet and see what comes up. And then you may even type in your city um, to see what comes up in your city. The other thing that patients can do and that I think is really helpful is that if you get a copy of your own biomarker testing, a lot of times right there on the result, it'll list out the clinical trials that are relevant for that particular biomarker and even give you a listing of where those trials are. So um, a lot of times we assume patients don't want the information um, from the actual um, report from their next generation sequencing, but as we educate and um, kind of really get advocates out there, you know, letting patients know how important the biomarker testing is, they can find often a list of the relevant clinical trials for their biomarker right there on the report. Um, and that can kind of guide them in their initial searches for clinical trials for their biomarker. And I think we can't forget that crowdsourcing for clinical trials is really one of the most effective ways. So I have patients that have found trials because they were part of a, of a group, of a patient support group, and someone in another state was in this trial, and that kind of opened up an opportunity to really look at a trial that was in their same state. So I had a patient that came from Jacksonville, which is pretty far from us, but she found a trial to the patient support group. And, uh, and that and you can reach out and, and people that have gone have gone to other trials already have made connections um, and that can be very helpful. I think um, a lot of patients want to know what's the purpose of a trial and are there any kind of risk associated with being in a trial? And I will answer the risk question first. And it's, it's a little bit um, kind of counterintuitive, but if you think about it in a clinical trial, you're monitored so closely and any risk that would be associated with any therapy are much more likely to be discovered while you're on a clinical trial. So if there's going to be any trouble with your kidneys or your liver while you're on a clinical trial, which could happen with the chemotherapy that's already approved anyway, you're going to be getting labs more frequently. You're going to be coming in to see the nurse a little bit more frequently and possibly even just phone calls to say, hey, how's everything going? Are you having any issues? Um, from the clinical trial coordinators. Our coordinators do that sometimes. And so I think you're monitored a little bit more closely. And so it, I feel like, diminishes risk that may be associated um, with the clinical trial. And as we get to the different stages or phases of the clinical trial, um, we have more experience with that particular drug or that molecule. And so there's even more information about what risk may be out there. So there's a phase one clinical trial that Dr. Rodriguez mentioned that she um, um, helps to facilitate it at her, at her clinic. And so that is the, you know, pretty much the first times that these drugs are being used in um, a single agent or either in combination with, a, with another chemotherapy or agent. And then in the phase two clinical trials, we have already established that it's effective or that we can see responses. So we want to study a bigger population and we're seeing more patients um, now being exposed to the medication to, to confirm that it works. And then in phase three, we're pretty much doing a much larger trial where we're comparing it to what's already considered to be the standard of care. So this is the way we treat this but now we have this new option and let's compare the two to see if one is better. Oh, it's better. And now we have a new standard of care. So that's kind of like the phases of clinical trials. But I feel like you get monitored so closely across that whole spectrum that it kind of reduces risk that you're going to have complications. Um, and at least if you're going to have them, they get identified much earlier. That's great information to have because it's just so important to know. And as we kind of like pull out the last question, okay, I'm going to tease out the last question. Karina asks, um, what are the typical eligibility criteria? My mom can't, uh, my mom can't do trials near her because of her poor ECOG PS and she's on oxygen. Can you guys give us some guidance, Dr. Rodriguez? So that gets to the point that we need to develop trials for the patients that are in the real world. And that is a real world patient. So patients with lung cancer, some of them, because of their disease, they're going to be on oxygen, and they have and patients with brain metastases are going to need 
clinical trials and many trials have excluded them in the past. So I'm very excited about, for example, the Pragmatica trial by SWOG. That is just really a trial that has no lab requirements. They don't, re they don't need to look at your oxygen status. They just need a doctor who has a patient in front of them and they just want to see what happened. They just want to evaluate their response. So we, we need to encourage more trials that are for patients that need them and have a lot of symptoms. Now, sometimes there are patients that are too sick to go into a trial because they're new drugs and we really don't know how they're tolerate them or we, we have serious concerns about toxicity and you kind of have to trust your doctor that they're, they're, those eligibility criteria are there to make it safe. Although we do know that sometimes it's to make it too safe, they're excluding patients that need treatment. And there is a big movement by the NCI to make trials for real world patients. That's the direction we need to really go in because we're real people and we need to have real, real, real world access. Well, it, okay. As uh, finally, okay. Before we leave tonight, what is the top takeaway that you hope our audience members leave with when it comes back to clinical trials and lung cancer? Dr. Rodriguez, you first. Um, so I, I just, you know, my, just not, don't be afraid to ask about clinical trials because if you, if you have a diagnosis of lung cancer, where a lot of patients are going to progress this is the fight of your life. And you, you, if you're not open to clinical trials, you're kind of closing your eyes to opportunities to, I always tell patients like immunotherapy trials, like those patients that went on those trials that are alive today, 10 years later, it was a trial. It was as scary as the trials that I, we're talking about to now. No one knew that drug would work and look what happened. That drug worked, it made the difference, it changed lives. So I just wanna give people the sense of hope that clinical trials over hope that people who do clinical trials do get better outcomes because they're monitored very closely for risk. And it just really gives you an opportunity to do better and, um, and really kind of push the envelope in a disease can be, that can be relentless. Okay, thank you, Dr. Porter. I, I would say that um, the clinical trials are very important, but I would love for the patients and the caregivers and everybody listening to take away the need for biomarker testing. And I know that we've heard it over and over again, but I don't think we can express that enough because most of the clinical trials are biomarker driven trials. So in order to even find out if a patient is going to be a candidate for that trial, we have to have their initial biomarker testing done. So not only have we not, I mean, have we increase the likelihood of them getting a relevant first line therapy, but we also increase the likelihood that at the time of progression, we will have a good clinical trial that may be available for them. And so I think that getting back to biomarker testing, which ultimately can lead to access to clinical trials, and then making sure that patients are asking, what's my biomarker test say? Did you do my biomarker test? And, and we can't ask that enough if you're at the clinic with your dad or your mom who's been diagnosed with lung cancer or any cancer, have you done any biomarker testing? You, if that is a, it holds us accountable as providers so that we make sure that we're doing that for patients, and then we give them good first line of standard of care and good clinical trial options when a, when a clinical trial is not appropriate in first line. Yeah, I totally agree. My top takeaway from all of this is you need to know what you are so that you can take charge with what you're doing because you're the patient in this and it's your skin of the game. Well, thank you guys so much for doing this tonight. I know it was like all push, pushed and we still had so we could go on for hours, but yeah. thank you so much. And I'm going to toss it to you, Stephanie. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you, Terry. Thank you, Drs. Porter and Rodriguez. Amazing conversation. And it's so clear you're so driven uh, to help patients and their families. So yes, thank you for the conversation tonight. Um, before we leave, again, your voice is so important to us, everyone who joined. So once the program ends, a link to a survey will pop up. Please fill that out. And that will automatically enter you into one of our um, $50 Amazon gift card raffles. And I know there were also lots of questions we didn't get to tonight. So we'll try our best to get some answers and send them in a follow-up email. With that, we hope to see you at a future program. For all of us from KRAS Kickers and the patient's story and from these amazing doctors, we hope you have an amazing evening. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.